Today's sermon comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Now, in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, Please, come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. People of God, will you join with me in prayer? Holy God, you hold us all in your nurturing and loving care. On this day when we remember the many mothers, the many women who have showed us what it means to be faithful and to cling to your goodness, Open our hearts and our eyes to your scriptures this morning. May we see and learn from the example of Tabitha. May her story in some way be a part of our story, that we would see the needs in our community, and that we would live and act to make your goodness known. Holy God, may these words and the meditations of all our hearts Bring your goodness into being. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who guides us all in the ways of love and faithfulness and hope. Amen. Here is an unmistakable biblical truth. Women count in the eyes of God. Women's voices, actions, testimonies, and expressions of faith are significant. In this season of Easter, we've already relayed that it was the women who first saw the empty tomb and went running to tell the other disciples. It is more than noteworthy to observe that in the first century world, that the women didn't always have the trust of the populace. And so when the Gospels put the good news of resurrection in women's mouths first, this is remarkable that it's they who tell this story of good news. You see, we've already remembered and celebrated this Easter season, that passage from Luke 24, how uh, this, this group of women came and told a story of good news, and the men who heard it, they trusted their testimony. Peter's legs of faith sent him running to see what the women had said to be true. In today's passage, we come to yet another encounter between Peter and a group of women with a story that they must show and tell with heart and urgency and conviction. In today's story, Peter will encounter a group of widows. In the words of Willie Jennings of Yale Divinity School, widows are that group of people who in the ancient world were often made vulnerable by death's sting, end quote. Our text today comes to us from a first century society that rarely paid attention to the voices of women and especially those like widows who had lost their social standing and voice in the social hierarchy. As an aside, we discover throughout the biblical narrative that God cares for those who are wrongly marginalized, those who are economically poor, 
and those whose power is robbed by those who flex their muscles by preying on people who are widows and orphans and foreigners. We discover these words in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 19. Cursed be anyone who deprives an alien, an orphan, or a widow of justice. All the people shall say, Amen! Exclamation point. If we're honest, we know what Tabitha knew, that there are those in our midst who are deprived of justice, respect, and voice. Knowing this in her context, Tabitha took real actions. We know that she used her hands making and mending clothes for those in her community. Every stitch was an act of neighborly love and consideration. Interestingly, though, we don't know the full extent of what else she did. I think Luke gives us a gift by not spelling out everything that Tabitha did on behalf of others. You see, by holding back these details, I'm convinced that Luke is activating our imaginations, uh, leaving us to wonder about the unmet needs that can lead to deeds among us. In a real way, I think the modern reader is left to think about the needs we know of in our city and in the zip codes adjacent to us. Can you imagine someone taking account of the conditions, possibilities, and opportunities for good, and then mobilizing and acting and transforming the systems that keep others down? What would this person look like? Someone who sees and then boldly acts for the good of their neighbors. Luke tells us what this person would look like. It would look like Tabitha. For Tabitha, her recognition of nearby circumstances led to a Christ-shaped response that made a tangible difference in the city of Joppa. I recently heard a story about a man who worked in a mill that turned grain into flour. One afternoon, he went all over town running errands after work. The story goes that everywhere he went, he left traces of himself. There were flower footprints and flower fingerprints, and by the end of the day, there was evidence of his presence all over town, at the bank and at the post office, at the store and at a neighbor's front porch and on the sidewalks that eventually led the man home. You get the idea that Tabitha's story was a bit like this. She left her mark on those she came to see and know and love. She listened and responded to the specific needs of her community with loving care and material generosity. Tabitha's life encapsulates the acts of the church that continue to matter and mean something. Her story was one of self-giving love for the sake of others. And so you can feel the heaviness and the grief in Luke's account when he reports that Tabitha grew ill. The text doesn't say if it's a long battle or if things took a turn for the worse in a hurry. All we really know is that this remarkable and saintly woman who did so very much for others grew ill and eventually that she died. It's really not that surprising that when she died, women all over town, they wept for her and perhaps they also wept over what this loss would mean for themselves. Who will listen now? Who will notice the unmet needs among us now? Who will care? I wonder, can you hear the women weeping in our text from today? And more practically, as a people of faith, can you hear the voices that are weeping in our day? Luke tells us that Tabitha's body was carried upstairs and it's from this upper room that the scene continues to develop. We learn that the women started gathering at Tabitha's bedside after she died. I guess you could say that they were paying their last respects. But what's so incredibly lovely to me is that these women come with the things that reminded them of Tabitha. 
Acts chapter 9, verse 39 records that the women are weeping and they're, they're showing the things that Tabitha had made. These women come with grief and emotion. They, they're showing up with tears in their eyes and they hold out their arms. She made this. She, she mended this. She stitched this for me. This makes me think of her. These garments are the photographs that they hold up for everyone else to see and to remember. These women are seemingly crowding the hallways and the stairway and overflowing into the front yard. They eventually gather together, stricken by the kind of pain that you only come to experience when you lose someone whose life is so intertwined with yours that you question how you'll be able to go on now that the person that you loved and who loved you is no longer here. We read in this account that after praying, Peter spoke to Tabitha, commanding her to get up, and astonishingly, she does. In the early church, resurrection life wasn't just something that Jesus' disciples witnessed, but we read here that there is something that they continued to be a part of that spoke and made sense of resurrection life. Now, to be sure, this is a story of resurrection life and hope after death. Through and through, this is an Easter account, and I'll remind you, we're still in this wonderful season when we celebrate Easter as the church together. Tabitha's story in Acts chapter 9, though, is undoubtedly an unusual one. This isn't the way most death scenes play out, even in Scripture. This is not typical. It defies our experience and our ability to fathom or explain. The best that I can do is relay that there was something about this loss and the prayers of grief that shook the very throne room of God. In this exceptional account, divinity roars back and Tabitha's very life is rekindled. I don't know about you, but I can almost picture all of these women, mouths agape, crowding and rushing back into that upstairs room to see and to speak with their friend again. I can see them still carrying and clutching clothes in their hands. Undoubtedly, the high point of the story is when Tabitha gets up. And yet... It's the rest of that story that presses and lingers in my imagination. Throughout this week, I've been wondering what the scene of Tabitha's second deathbed would have looked like. At least in my imagination, I can envision the scene of her second deathbed looking a little bit like her first, surrounded by friends who are now again grieving the loss of a woman that had meant so very much to them. No doubt the last time she died must have been a part of the conversation, but this time wouldn't be like the last time. I wonder what Tabitha's last words were the second time around. I wonder if on her deathbed, on that occasion, if it was a, a sudden or prolonged struggle. And the fact is that we don't know and perhaps I'm making too much of what isn't recorded. But it remains the case that Tabitha's life was marked by resurrection through and through. Acts unpacks a story about the church and the people who will continue to place their hope and trust in a God who defied death. The point of this story isn't to normalize Tabitha's experience, the point of this story is to encounter lives that are forever changed by the love and life of God. Tabitha put her faith into action in ways that can be a compelling guide and example for the church of every age. Acts narrates a story about the beginning of the church. Jesus' first disciples carried out a message of love and justice and hope, even in the most unexpected places, and when loss seemed all but certain. Act is a, Acts is a story about bold faith and what it means to cling to God's ways, even when the way forward is challenging and cloudy. On this weekend, when we remember the mothers who have made a positive difference in our lives, 
We also do our best to look to those who have shown us stories of hope and sacrifice and compassion in ways that bring health and transformation into our common lives. I don't know who is coming to your mind today, who you're remembering and celebrating, or who you're looking to to guide your faithful actions in our common world. It makes sense, though, on this day that we look to Tabitha to remember her story and to think about what it means for us to all follow in the footsteps of this wonderful woman. Tabitha reminds us to work for good, to listen to those who are hurting, and to do all that you possibly can to make our communities a place where all are loved, respected, recognized, and cared for. Tabitha teaches us something about living hope making a tangible difference in the world. And that's what Easter is all about.